It's 7 a.m., so we will start gently. Uh, I welcome you uh, to this uh, webinar organized by the International Academy of Psychology. Uh, this will be the first of uh, a series of uh, webinar, and uh, I suggest you to check uh, regularly the web page. Um, of uh, uh, International Academy of Cytology to look for the next uh, session. Um, there will be another section, the same one, the same one in uh, uh, later in the afternoon at 5 p.m. so that we can give a possibility also to people from Europe or from uh, US uh, to participate. And uh, uh, today we will discuss about thyroid fine needle aspiration, uh, the Bethesda system, and uh, the possibility to perform a molecular test. Uh, which test to use? One, uh, this webinar will be more a guide that can uh, uh, enable you to choose the right test and to understand uh, um, how it's work and uh, uh, when you can ask for a molecular test. Uh, you will see that uh, dur during my presentation, I will present several commercial tests. Um, I have nothing to disclose um, about this test. I am not a consultant for any of this test and I do not get any uh, compensation from, uh, from, uh, from uh, these uh, companies. So let's start with uh, the yeah, thyroid fine needle aspiration, and let's start with the problem of thyroid nodular proliferation. This is uh, really a common problem that affects the general population. And uh, we know also that the uh, incidence of thyroid cancer is increasing, but it seems that uh, only uh, two to 5% of all this nodule discovered in the thyroid will be uh, malignant with the cancer. So what is our role? Our role as cytologists is to exclude a malignancy, is to exclude a cancer in all these cases. And fortunately, we have a test, a good test, an excellent test that is fine needle aspiration that help us um, to, to exclude the malignancy in, uh, in certain condition. It is an accurate and cost-effective methods and now we consider that the gold standard to perform a fine needle aspiration is to associate uh, it with uh, ultrasonography. So we can say that we have some good news concerning thyroid fine needle aspiration because uh, uh, it permits to, to reduce surgery by 50%. It has increased uh, the yield of uh, malignancy by two, 3% and have also decreased the cost to manage thyroid nodule by 25%. Uh, one of the most important uh, good news that we have concerning uh, thyroid uh, fine needle aspiration is the introduction of the Bethesda system. Um, the Bethesda system is a long story that started in uh, 2007 at Bethesda in Maryland where a conference uh, uh, involving cytologists, pathologists, uh, um, radiologists, uh, surgeon, endocrinologists, uh, nuclear medicine physician, uh, decided, they decided to uh, have a common reporting system because uh, until then, every institution uh, did their own uh, uh, study our own uh, reporting system. So uh, there was the need to uniform all this reporting system. So after that uh, um, conference, uh, the first version of the Bethesda system came out and uh, it was really uh, an important uh, improvement uh, and advance in the care of our patient because uh, it permits the standardization and the reproducibility uh, of thyroid fine needle aspiration. And also it was the basis uh, 
uh, for the molecular study, it was the basis, uh, the standardization of the diagnostic category for the basis uh, uh, to compare also a molecular study and uh, to evaluate the performance of this molecular study because at the basis we had the same categories. So it was a great uh, success, uh, at least in Europe and the US. Um, it is uh, the most widely uh, used reporting system. It has been translated in four languages. And uh, um, as I said before, it's permit the uh, standardization of application of molecular test in fine needle aspiration. So this is the classic uh, uh, table of the Bethesda system. The success of this system was in part due also to the publication of the risk of malignancy, because each category is associated with the risk malignancy and management. And so endocrinologists and clinicians liked this very much because um, if you are not aware uh, how to manage um, a result, a cytology result, you can have a look here and uh, discover the risk of malignancy and also the suggested uh, management. It was easy to use because, as you can see, with this uh, uh, red line, we can draw a line uh, dividing cases that do not need surgery uh, and cases that uh, need surgery. This is the first. Uh, this was in the, in the first version. Uh, then, in less than ten years. Uh, we saw that there were more than 1,600 publications concerning the Bethesda system. And uh, the risk of malignancy, the management uh, has been uh, modified. So it was decided to uh, go for a, a review of the Bethesda system. So um, a proposition for uh, uh, a, a, new, a, a new version. And this new version was preceded by a discussion in between experts that uh, were divided in the different chapter and check the literature to see what's going on on thyroid fine needle. And this is the result. It's the same table, but a little bit more uh, um, complicated because in the meantime, there was also the history of a NITF um, that came out. So the encapsulated uh, follicular variant of papillary arterial carcinoma that having a low risk of malignancy was considered uh, no more as a carcinoma, but as a low uh, risk uh, tumor. So um, the commission uh, that uh, took care of the risk of malignancy decided to split the risk of malignancy in two different columns. One, if we consider uh, uh, the NIFT, uh, uh, as a benign lesion, as a low uh, potential malignant lesion, and one is considered uh, beneath the, as a carcinoma. So you have two different risks of malignancy. So if we consider the second version of the Bethesda, uh, what's, what's new? Uh, in principle, the six original categories have uh, stayed, stay here. And what change uh, is that we know do not have to wait three to six months to repeat fine needle aspiration. We can do it uh, one week after or even wait, it's, it's not a problem. And that uh, we decide, the, the commission decided not to split the terminology for that category that have two names, for example, the IUS plus and the follicular neoplasma suspicious for a follicular neoplasma. So, but even if we did not split the categories, uh, it was seen that uh, subcategorization can be informative, it can also be interesting. For example, you have here the classic six categories, but uh, in each category, you can explain why you did this diagnosis. For example, for non-diagnostic, because you have an acellular specimen, uh, for example, for benign, if you have an important lymphocytic infiltration with oncocyte that can suggest an Hashimoto thyroiditis. And this is important because permits to do uh, clinical pathological correlation. And uh, also in the malignant category, you can uh, explain or you can specify 
what kind of uh, uh, malignancy you have. So you can add notes, recommendation in your diagnosis, uh, and especially concerning the possibility of an IFP that is not a cytological diagnosis, that's clear. But if you have certain features, you can suggest this diagnosis. So I don't stay longer on uh, each diagnostic category because probably you know very well. I want just to uh, specify some uh, um, uh, data, for example, for the non-diagnostic, the presence of a six group is still there. So we need six group of follicular cells and each group should have at least uh, 10 cells per group. For example, you have here a uh, fluid uh, aspiration that is uh, consistent with uh, cystic contents. You have macrophages, you have some fibrin and liquid colloid, you have hemosiderophages, and this is diagnosis uh, is diagnosed as non um, diagnostic, but you have to specify that it consisted with cystic content, because in the appropriate clinical setting, uh, the endocrinologist uh, uh, can or radiologist can consider this aspiration is benign. Um, considering the benign category, nothing has changed. Um, the basis of the benign category is the presence of macro follicles. You have here um, an histological specimen where you clearly show the nodule the, the, um, here, composed mostly of macro follicles, some normal follicles, and you have here normal thyroid that is compressed. So on a cytological ground, you can also do this diagnosis of a benign nodule. You have here nice macro follicular structure. You see here normal follicular structure, and if you use, if you use the focus, of your microscope, you can easily detect colloid inside these uh, follicles. An exception in the benign category is the colloidal nodule, where you have just um, colloid with few or no follicular cell, cracky colloid or liquid colloid. And in this case, you can also do a, a benign diagnosis because colloidal nodules are, are almost never uh, malignant. And then we move uh, um, in uh, some categories uh, that are so-called indeterminate categories, uh, the IUS plus and the follicular neoplasm category, where honestly we have some problem with cytology because uh, we do not perform so well. Um, this is a categories that comprise different scenarios. And it's a category that is also difficult to understand by, by clinician. Um, it should not be, uh, um, it should not exceed 10% uh, of your diagnostic categories, and you should not use uh, uh, put cases here or cases that you don't know or where you have a problem. Um, there are uh, really a lot of uh, possibilities here, and uh, the main things is that also in this category, most nodules are benign at surgery, but uh, uh, the malignancy, risk of malignancy is high uh, for follow-up, at least in Europe and in uh, Western countries is considered too high for clinical follow-up. Uh, the situation is different in Eastern countries, uh, in the Asian countries where uh, active surveillance uh, can be an option to, to follow these cases. And unfortunately for us, uh, this category has also a high interobservable variability. And we know that uh, we are not agree on what, what is our last and what is not. Um, if we uh, regard this category uh, from the point of view of molecular tests, uh, we see that there are two um, important categories. Um, that of atypia, architectural atypia, and cytological atypia. Architectural atypia um, cons uh, consists of the presence of microfollicular structures in a, a benign lesion uh, or the presence of microfollicular structures in a poorly cellulated specimen. In this case, we do not know 
if we are in presence of a benign lesion or a follicular adenoma. So um, the cellularity is not so important. And so we should use this uh, um, category. Another uh, scenario that is important uh, because of um, the possibility to use molecular tests is that of mild nuclear atypia. We have cases that seems to be benign, um, but some cells uh, present some nuclear groups, uh, some uh, chromatin clearing, like here, for example. And so we are not uh, confident to call this benign. Uh, we prefer to do a, rep a repetition of fine needle aspiration or in other cases where the cellular, uh, cellularity is low, but we have some typical nuclei, so we prefer to put uh, um, the aspirate in this category. So, as I said before, we do not perform very well in this category because uh, fine needle aspiration is considered a screening test, and this is because the risk of malignancy is, is low, but still it's 10, 30 percent if you consider with a NIFP as a carcinoma or at least as a surgical disease, and is 6 to 18 if we consider NIFP as not a carcinoma, but it's still high, at least in Europe and US, to be simply followed up. And as you can see, the usual management, uh, differently from the first version of the Bethesda, is uh, molecular testing and also lobectomy. Um, the utilization of the molecular test has been also endorsed by the ATA guidelines, uh, where, uh, yes, for sure, you can also repeat fine needle aspiration and in cases you have still an IUS plus diagnosis. Um, or even if you don't have this diagnosis, you can move directly to uh, a molecular test. Um, another category uh, where we do not perform so well as cytologists is the follicular neoplasm or suspicion for a follicular neoplasm um, that is composed mainly by microfollicles. Um, the revised version of the Bethesda system uh, prefer not to split uh, these two terms, um, but use uh, both as a synonym. And yes, for sure, you are familiar with that. This is a really nice pictures that we should always see in our fine needle This is a group of micro follicles. You have normal follicles, um, but the predominance of the smears is composed by small follicles, less than 12 cells. This is what is written on the book, but then it's, it's a variable. And you can also see here how different they can present, sometimes with colloid sign, sometimes with no colloid. Sometimes it can also be isolated. And you have here, for example, uh, something that is considered as a normal follicular structure. But what is the problem with this? Um, the problem is now that in this uh, category, you can also uh, have some uh, nuclear atypia, slight nuclear atypia. And this is because uh, the problem of the NITP, so increased nuclear size, irregularity of the nuclear contour, chromatin clearing now are admitted also in this category. And uh, you can suggest in a note that some nuclear features can raise the possibility of an ISP because uh, we are not able to, to differentiate all this uh, 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 lesion on cytology. We don't know, we do not know if it's a follicular hyperplasia, an adenoma or carcinoma, a follicular variant of PTC or an ISP. So again, also for this category, uh, fine needle aspiration is a screening test. And actually here, the risk of malignancy is uh, more important, most important. So um, the management, uh, the suggested management in molecular testing or directly uh, lobectomy. I remember just that follicular carcinoma can only be diagnosed on histology, thanks to the presence of capsular invasion, or vascular invasion. And we do not see these features of on cytology, for sure. So for the next category, the suspicious for malignancy, nothing has changed in the new version. 
And also some few cases of NIFTI can be diagnosed in this category um, because uh, it was decided that we should keep um, the malignant category only for cases that, where we are sure that there is a papillary carcinoma and uh, where we are sure of the classic features of PTC, for example, papillary architectures, nuclear inclusion, epsomoma bodies. If we have one of these uh, features or, or more features combined together, um, uh, the possibility of an IFP is rare. So we can uh, leave these cases uh, as malignant. And uh, for both categories, suspicious for malignancy and malignance, uh, final aspiration is a diagnostic text because we perform very well and the risk of malignancy, as you can see, is very high. Um, it depends on, also on you, how confident you are to call a lesion suspicious or to call a lesion malignant. But in general, we can say that final aspiration perform very well. So in these two categories, uh, molecular test is not uh, um, seen uh, foreseen by the Bethesda, but we can also apply molecular test here and we will see later why. So if we come back to our bad news, uh, I said that this indeterminate category is a problem for us because we lack specificity. And um, what is the indeterminate category? Well, someone consider various flas, plus the follicular neoplasma, suspicious for a follicular neoplasma category in the indeterminate category, and the author consider also the suspicious for malignancy category inside. It depends on uh, each institution and of the risk of malignancy of uh, each category. So the problem is that too many patients do not need surgery in this category. So some years ago, 10 years ago, almost we, we thought that immunocytochemistry uh, could have been the ideal solution. Unfortunately, the ideal marker is this one that I found. <laughs> and uh, um, immunocytochemistry, for example, for galactin-3, HBME1, or cytokeratin-19, were widely used, but was not, were not so successful in uh, help us to detect malignant lesion. Um, they are, have a low specificity and also the lack of reproducibility. Um, I have to say if, that if you perform this uh, on cell block, uh, or if you perform this uh, on liquid-based cytology, uh, you get more uh, reproducible data because uh, you uh, standardized um, the procedure, but if you perform that on uh, smears, on direct smears, then it's a little bit more complicated um, to, to manage this every day. So this is the reason why the Bethesda moved to, to the molecular testing, to suggest the molecular testing, and to see if this can help us in the undetermined category. But before to perform a molecular test, what do you need to know? You need to know the prevalence of a genetic alteration in your population. Um, we know that VBRAF mutation is more uh, present, more frequent, more prevalent in the Asian population in, compar in comparison to the European population. Um, we should know how to perform it if we have the good material, if we have to get another fine needle aspiration. We have to know what's the meaning of this test if we come back positive or if we come back negative, if we can be reassured by a negative test or not. And then we also should decide before what we do once we have the result. It's a result that permits to avoid surgery or is a result that enroll the patient for surgery. And then never forget that you have also, um, uh, you have also to discuss with the patient to see the preferences because patients in front of uh, a risk of malignancy um, act differently one from uh, the other. And there are also additional features that can help the patient to decide um, 
that are also ultrasound features, uh, other therapeutic option that together with molecular test can finally um, decide for surgery or not. So we know that the, the genetic alteration in thyroid tumors are driven um, by two groups of uh, alteration, the BRAF and red PTC, uh, concerning the papillary structures and the RAS and Pax8 PIPAR gamma modification concerning the follicular structure. Uh, this was confirmed by the well-known uh, study of the cancer genome atlas network where they were able to split actually the cases with the papillary structure from cases with the uh, follicular structure and that are different genetic mutation. So we spoke before about the prevalence uh, of um, um, alteration the molecular alteration uh, inside uh, uh, a carcinoma. For example, if we consider papillary carcinoma, we know that uh, 60 to 80 percent of PTC uh, harbor one of these uh, oncogenes. Um, unfortunately, uh, no one of these oncogenes is present in 100 percent of uh, carcinoma. So, for example, BRAF is present up to 30, 50% of cases. This means that half of cases do not have the BRAF mutation. And this is important when you get a negative BRAF result. The other are more rare, as you can see, red PTC 1020 and the rest point mutation 1020 also. Um, again, so do we need BRAF analysis? or thyroid of any the aspiration. Well, if we know that uh, the specificity is high, is very high, close to 100%, probably yes. But then we have to know that sensitivity is 50%. That means that not 50% of our PTC do not have this pre af mutation. And you have also to be aware about the presence of some pitfall concerning BRAF mutation, because BRAF is very common in uh, um, human cancers. And uh, you can have uh, BRAF mutation in melanoma, colorectal carcinoma, lung, et cetera, et cetera, and also in primary lung cystocytosis of the thyroid. So if you get a positive BRAF mutation in a fine needle aspiration, uh, you have to correlate that with morphology. And you have also to rule out a metastasis in the, in the thyroid from some of this uh, uh, carcinoma where BRAF is, is present. These are rare occasions, but you have to uh, keep in mind also this. So do we need also red PTC? It seems to be also specific for PTC, but we have seen that there are cases of Hashimoto thyroiditis, uh, oncocytic adenomas, or oncocytic carcinoma that are positive. So how can I manage this, uh, this result in my population? And if you move to follicular thyroid carcinoma, also here, unfortunately, the RAS mutation is not uh, uh, so prevalent, uh, up to 40, again, 50% of cases, and a little bit less for the Pax8 uh, rearrangement. So what do we do with, with that? Uh, can be this useful for uh, for our uh, fine needle aspiration. We know that, for example, RAS is present in 30% of follicular adenomas. And this is important to know because we, do not, uh, we don't uh, want to uh, tell a patient that he has a RAS mutation and sure it's a carcinoma, no. And the same is true for a Pax8 rearrangement uh, that is present also in 8% of follicular adenoma. So the specificity of this translocation is very high for carcinoma uh, in comparison to, to, to the RAS mutation. And can we use this uh, knowing that it's not so prevalent uh, in the population? So once we have decided to perform a molecular test, we, we can also to choose the right material. And uh, what, we, what we can use? Fortunately, in cytology, we get really high quality DNA and RNA for molecular analysis from 
all specimens that we have from alcohol fixed cells, from liquid based cytology, or conventional smear. We can use hydrides uh, specimen, we can use cell block, and uh, several studies have shown that this material can be stored in archives and we can use that with good, good quality DNA and RNA um, also after several years. And then if we have this kind of material, how we can perform a molecular analysis. We need DNA for BRAF and RAS point mutation, and we need for translocation um, RNA so we can perform FISH or RT-PCR. Um, this approach, this single or limited panels of gene approach is uh, the approach that is preferred in Europe and Eastern countries. Um, the access to the factory um, NGS test um, is, uh, is available, is possible, but uh, the cost is probably limited a little bit its uh, use uh, in Europe and the Eastern countries. Um, you can use a macro dissection to take material from your slides. Um, you are, you are not sure 100% that you get all the cell of interest, but uh, if the smears is highly simulated with uh, a population of cell of interest, you can be sure that you are analyzing the right cell, for example. You can use a cell block. Uh, again, here you can be sure of what you are analyzing. Uh, unfortunately, not all the cell block are uh, cellular and contain um, a lot of material, or you can perform a dedicated passes um, for your molecular test. And if you perform that under uh, uh, ultrasound guidance, you can also be sure that the material that you get for the molecular analysis comes from the lesion and is representative of what you seen, uh, what you have seen on the slides. There is another possibility that I used, but it's uh, time consuming and it's cost a lot. It's laser capture micro dissection. You can check uh, on the microscope, the population, the target population, and then be sure that uh, you are analyzing and have a good enrichment of uh, tumoral cells. But again, it's not cost effective. So you can also think, uh, do I perform a molecular test uh, uh, routinely on my fine needle aspiration or I have to choose uh, particular cases? For example, do I perform a routinely molecular test on uh, nuclear atypia or architecture atypia in uh, the Bethesda three category, house plus? Um, or I prefer to use, for example, if I have a PTC scenario with nuclear atypia, I prefer to concentrate on BRAF or red PTC that are specific for papillary carcinoma and uh, uh, to leave the BRAF uh, RAS PAX8 if I have uh, um, architectural atypia. You have also to know that usually this category has poor cellularity, so probably you do not have enough material to perform uh, a complete panel of tests and you have to choose one or the other. It depends also on how you perform to, to morphologically to do um, your diagnosis. If you perform very well and you detect nuclear atypia, um, pro probably you will prefer a BRAF red PTC um, test. Also for a follicular neoplasma, suspicion for a follicular neoplasma category, should I do a reflex test in all cases or in selected cases? Here you have more material because specimens are usually cellulated. Uh, if are not, you put it in the house diagnosis. And then also if your diagnosis is pure, that you limited uh, to put the cases in this category, cases that are uh, uh, predominant of uh, micro, follicle, micro follicles, then you, you should choose uh, RAS, PAX8, and probably also be RAF uh, 601. So this was a study performed in 2015 using a small um, panel of molecular marker, the one that you have seen so far. And uh, um, 
they show that in uh, the follicular neoplasma category, Thai tree is the English uh, um, for follicular neoplasma. So uh, they show that uh, they were able to have a risk of malignancy or positive sample or a mutation positive sample of 71%, which is quite high, and a post uh, risk of malignancy for a negative sample of 18%. So we were, we were be able to uh, um, stratify a little bit the risk of malignancy uh, in these cases. And one thing that I found interesting is that they said that if you have acknowledged that there is a mutation, for example, the RAS mutation, then you are prone to perform additional uh, cuts on the slides, on the histological specimen. You are prone to look carefully at the capsule. And finally, you will find some capsular invasion or vascular invasion, and you will find a minimally invasive follicular carcinoma. Um, someone also considered these uh, um, cases, for example, follicular adenoma with RAS mutation as follicular carcinoma in situ. Um, so do we need also a molecular test in uh, the suspicious for malignancy? In this category, if uh, you have a malignancy risk very high in your institution, then you don't, not, you don't need a molecular test. But if your um, malignancy risk is around 50%, 70%, you can decide also to perform a molecular test to avoid a frozen section. If the hospital is far away from your hospital, from your lab, or if you have several hospitals to serve, uh, you can decide to perform molecular to avoid a two-step surgery in case um, the diagnosis turn out to be malignant in sample lobectomy, for example. And then as in this category, you put almost cases that are positive for papillary carcinoma, you can decide to perform just the RAF and RAF PCC that are more specific for um, papillary carcinoma. Do we need also molecular test in the malignant category? Well, this is a, a little bit debated. Uh, it depends if you need to change your surgical management. Uh, and it depends if you want uh, then to perform additional therapy and uh, also can help you in, a, in a decided the right follow up because. Um, it seems that BRAF mutation is associated with uh, a worse outcome. Uh, there are also some colleagues, some papers that say that it's not associated with a worse outcome, but it's just associated with uh, uh, features of aggressiveness, for example, uh, extratheroidal extension, or is associated with a higher grade of the diagnosis. But for sure, the association of TERT mutation and BRAF is a, a worst prognostic factor. So probably in some indication to perform a third analysis and DRAF mutation analysis on the positive case can be, can, can be useful. Um, when we have uh, another approach to molecular tests that is used in the USA and is the um, large panel NGS-based molecular uh, analysis these are a, a proprietary system. And in this case, what you have to do is to perform fine needle aspiration, put the material in a tube, send your tube by mail, and then you will get your report by mail in uh, uh, seven to 10 days. Um, well, there are uh, different uh, companies that are selling uh, different tests with different uh, negative and positive predictive values. You have here a list of the most common. And I put here also the website where you can go and check um, what they are using, how they perform. This is the Affirma uh, genomic sequencing classifier that is used uh, um, to, to reduce surgery. Um, they give you a, a report where they, you have uh, the result of the cytology examination, then you have the result of the gene expression classifier, and then you have a diagnostic summary taken that take together all this uh, finding. You have another one that is the Thai GeneX uh, uh, Thai Ramir that uh, also studied uh, 10 genes and uh, 37 RNA fusion 
um, and for uh, mRNA markers uh, based on NGS, <clears throat> or the TISEC uh, test, a genomic classifier that also provide you um, good results if applied to the indeterminate categories. You can see here the Bethesda 5, the suspicious for malignancy categories is also put uh, in the determinate uh, category. Uh, this is a nice review where you can uh, go and see uh, the comparison and differences in between uh, all these tests uh, on the gene uh, studied, etc., uh, etc. Et so um, please go, go to see this review. And now for the title sec, we are at the third uh, version of the genomic classifier. There are more genes, 112 genes, and uh, there are a lot of uh, alterations that are studied. And the authors say that uh, this test get a good sensitivity, high sensitivity and uh, specificity. Um, the, the test also provides you information about the molecular profile of uh, the nodules that are tested positive. So you can see the prevalence, for example, of this mutation, and you can see the probability of uh, cancer, the positive predictive value, for example, that is 100% if you have a TERP of P53, and 100% also if you have a, a BRAF mutation or other. Uh, uh, mutation. For sure, the, <clears throat> the, the possibility to have cancer is uh, uh, decreasing with other uh, molecular tests for uh, RAS because we have seen that it's also present in the uh, uh, follicular adenoma. So, concerning this uh, also multi panel uh, uh, gene test, which one do you use? Again, there should be a communication in between you and your clinician, and you have to reach an agreement of which one to use because probably you can use one, but the clinician that does, does not need this one. Um, there are two different tests, uh, rule in and rule out. In general, rule in are the tests that uh, um, are useful if you decide to um, operate the the patient to move to surgery the patient and to rule out if you decide to follow up the patient. So for a, a ruling test to predict malignancy, you need a good positive predictive values. And if you decide to use a rule out test because in your population, the prevalence of cancer is low and you perform well with your fine needle aspiration to detect negative cases. Uh, so you should have a good high negative predictive values. Again, on this review, you can uh, have a look and you can check all the negative predictive values and positive predictive values. Um, data are different uh, from a study, from different studies. So um, you have to check which one is better for you. Also concerning um, cancer prevalence here, we are around 25%. And again, you can also see here how is the diagnostic accuracy in, uh, um, in the different uh, uh, tests? Um, the cost in US is reimbursed by insurance um, and is uh, high for, for a um, test. I mean, it's not high, but it's the cost of a, of a molecular test. So do we need to perform this uh, multi-gene test in our undeterminate category? where we know the surgery is unnecessary in uh, three-thirds of cases. Can we accept to follow that this patient? Probably in Europe and uh, Western countries, 25% of malignancy risk is too high uh, to follow a patient. We are afraid to be pursued by the patient in case uh, uh, there are some problem. I mean, we follow up a patient for a nodule that turn out uh, some years after to be a malignant, so we can have some problem. Um, in the Asian, in the uh, Eastern population, it's, it's different. They now do uh, active surveillance uh, that works very well. So we are, they are able to follow this patient probably with uh, active surveillance. And um, 
probably if we perform a molecular test on these categories, we are able to lower the risk of malignancy. And if you use a test that has uh, high negative predictive values, um, how, uh, how, for example, like the test that we showed before, so we can accept a risk of malignancy similar to that of a benign category. So before to decide which one test to use, we have to also to check your disease prevalence, uh, the specificity, and also cost effectiveness of, uh, of, uh, of the test. Um, do we need this uh, test, uh, uh, large panel in the suspicious for malignancy category? Uh, here we will choose probably a ruling test because we have to detect malignancy and uh, there are no agreements for the moment so on the minimum of positive predictive values that we need to have a good test. Um, again, it depends only also on uh, the risk of malignancy of your morphological category. If it's very high or if it's low because you are able to detect and to classify correctly uh, positive versus uh, uh, negative cases. So as I said before, this is another um, interesting article that uh, explain uh, the difference also that you have between Western and Eastern countries. For example, in Eastern countries, uh, active surveillance uh, is, uh, is uh, followed and uh, uh, again, uh, associated with uh, sonographic findings. So probably we perform just a single mutation for BRAF because BRAF is higher in Asian population in the comparison to uh, Western countries. And uh, at the end, we see that they get a similar resection rate and risk of malignancy um, in between just uh, um, following actively the patient and uh, applying a molecular test as in the Western countries. So also uh, on this article, you can uh, see how uh, the test perform in the different category. And uh, you have also comparison with a single gene uh, test. So we are almost uh, at the end. Um, we have different possibility, a single gene test and the specificities and sensitivities are related to the gene that you use. Uh, you have to check before the prevalence of the mutation in uh, the tumoral population you have. You can use a small gene panel test that cover 65, 70% of all the alteration. And then the specificity and sensitivity um, are a little bit uh, higher, or you can also use this uh, uh, multi-panel test, uh, NGS-based, uh, um, where you have a 90% of coverage with uh, good specificity and uh, sensitivity. You can also stratify your patient according to the molecular uh, alteration. There are low risk molecular alteration that are very high risk that need uh, um, an uh, immediate uh, action. So in conclusion, uh, uh, molecular analysis uh, in uh, cytology, in cytology is effect. And uh, the use of molecular markers uh, permits to increase your sensitivity by 20%. If you decide for an in-house test, you have to choose uh, the best one uh, according to your environment, to the prevalence of the molecular alteration in your population. And uh, you can also use a risk certification based on molecular test, uh, but then uh, you have to decide to discuss um, the result also with the patient preferences and also with uh, other aspects, for example, ultrasound appearance, uh, uh, and et cetera, et cetera.